Hi everybody, it's a great, great pleasure to talk to you today about my book, Foresight, How the Chemistry of Life Reveals Planning and Purpose. First of all, I would like to thank Discover Institute in the United States and also Mackenzie's University in Brazil for setting up this collaboration, for setting up the Center for Research in Intelligent Design here in Brazil that at the end made possible the publication of this book. And the bo this book has made a great impact. It was really nice to see that once it was number one new release in evolution in the Amazon. And also once it was top a thousand best-selling books in that list. It was great. And also uh, the book received endorsements of three Nobel laureates. So if you could read fast, you could see what they said about the book. They endorse a book that was discussing the possibility that will, will uh, have been made by the intelligent design. And what is foresight? What I meant for foresight in this book? Oh, in this book, what I meant for foresight is this. A foresight is the ability, unique of a mind, to predict what will happen or be needed in the future. And not only to predict, but also to provide in advance ingenious solutions for these futures life or death problems. So foresight, what I meant in the book, is this ability that is always linked to a mind. And uh, I now want to give you some examples, clear examples of foresight that you understand better what I meant for foresight. For instance, when Henry Ford decided to construct a car, he projected the car, he visualized the car in his mind. He could see the car running on the streets in the future. And by looking at the future, he could also realize two major problems with his car. The car would come to a hill and it would need to turn, make turns. And also, if the speed was too high, he would need to brake that car. So by playing with this foresight ability, he installed two devices in his car, a steering device and brakes. So this is what I call ingenious foresight, that only a mind can do it. Uh, another example, when you send a man to uh, the moon, we send a man to the moon to, the, to open space, we also had to play with foresight. We had to have this ability, what I call the meticulous and highly intricate foresight. You had to predict what this man would face on uh, open space, what the needs would be for him to survive there. And so the engineers had to develop, to design the space suits. This is what I call meticulous and highly intricate foresight. Uh, an example that helps you understand what I mean for foresight. When we travel, we we'll go camping for instance. Uh, we have to predict what we will uh, encounter in this camp and we have to take with us uh, the, uh, the tools, food and everything, clothes. Uh, when we travel, women, uh, they, they uh, with foresight, they, they also predict uh, uh, the situations that uh, she will face, the, the meetings, uh, the dinners, and she packs enough clothes for that. And, but this is what I call excessive foresight. But I think the best uh, illustration of foresight is given by this figure. A uh, small rat, a mouse, is facing a system that is not yet working. And he could see in that system a mortal problem that would uh, occur in the future if he decided to take the, the cheese. So this is what I call evolutionary foresight because we know that rats don't have this ability yet, but they may evolve it. And so uh, by looking at the future, he could realize that he would need to solve this problem. And he's, he solved this problem by a helmet. That's evolutionary foresight. So foresight adds to uh, uh, the four pillars of intelligent design. 
pillars of argumentation that we have. Before we had irreducible, co irreducible complexity, we also had information, abstract information, and we also had fine tuning. And now we have another pillar of argumentation for intelligent design, wh what is foresight. So I think now that the team is complete, the fantastic four teams of arguments for intelligent design. But uh, in this book, I argue that we can, can see this foresight both in the universe, in the earth, and also in life. And the designer had, to, had this ability of foresight to plan for the future, for, to solve uh, major mortal problems that would happen in, in the universe, on earth, in life itself. For us to survive in this universe, for us to survive in this earth, and for life to, to be uh, adapted to earth. So I'll give you some examples first of the foresight in the universe, or in the Earth, what I call the cosmological foresight. And example number one, the ozone layer. Earth was placed to the sun. It's a nearly perfect star. It uh, is stable. It does not expand and contract as many stars do. It will be stable for four, uh, five billion years. It emits the right uh, radiation, IR radiation, to heat up the planet, UV radiation, and also visible light. But there was a problem. Uh, the sun was emitting nearly perfect radiation with good UVA, but excessive UVB and harmful UVC. It's for the sun a, a devil-angel paradox. But what was the solution? A very ingenious, the most ingenious interplay of physics and chemistry. Uh, the ozone layer. Uh, our atmosphere was uh, filled with nitrogen and oxygen. It's this atmosphere that would automatically form and sustain an ozone layer, a protective ozone layer. And the chemistry of this layer is really amazing. It's mind-boggling in many ways. As you can see here in this uh, illustration, UVC, this harmful uh, radiation that comes from the sun, is blocked by the oxygen, molecular oxygen. This molecular oxygen then breaks down to oxygen and uh, atomic oxygen. And this atomic oxygen now reacts with molecular oxygen to form O3, ozone. So the first problem is solved by oxygen. But then oxygen, by reacting with molecular oxygen, form ozone, O3, that now blocks excessive UVB. And only 10% of this radiation, UVB, passes through ozone, the ozone layer, exactly the amount of radiation, UVB radiation, that we need. But now, when ozone absorbs this excessive UVB, it breaks down again to atomic oxygen and molecular oxygen. So the cycle is, is formed, and this protection uh, can function for many, many years. It's really nice. And it's really nice also to see that UVC and UVB, which were the problems, they are now used to provide the solution for the same problems that they cause. It's nice. Really mind-boggling. Example number two, lightning. Well, there is a problem with our atmosphere. Uh, atmosphere, our atmosphere in, in our planet should be stable. And nitrogen and oxygen, they are stable. They don't react it, with each other. But in order to, for us to, to exist in this planet, to be uh, formed in this planet, nitrogen would have to react with oxygen to form ammonia and then proteins. So what was the solution for this dilemma? Uh, was lightning the perfect control of reaction time and extension of a highly energy demanding reaction, nitrogen with oxygen. And this reaction now forms in, in OX and ammonia, and then form proteins, and then form us. So it's really nice that the problem of forming 
humans from a stable atmosphere was solved with lightning. A third example, supernatural water. The water is supernatural in many ways, but uh, what was the problem that water solves? Uh, the Earth needed a lot of liquid in, uh, in, with many, many specific physical, chemistry, uh, physical chemical properties to buffer its temperature. And also water uh, was in need of a liquid that could sustain life in many ways. So what was the solution? To make water supernatural in its, in its property, water has 74 unique properties that allows it to buffer the temperature of the planet and also to sustain life. But there was another problem with water. We know in, uh, from physics and chemistry that solids sink, but ice must float on liquid water. It was a major problem for life in, on Earth. So what was the solution? Ingenious interplays of three-dimensional hydrogen bonding properties of water, both in liquid and crystal forms, to make solid water expand. That was a really, really nice interplay with physics and chemistry. So why is the reason that the, the ice floats on liquid water? You know, in, in cold uh, continents, we have a lake. In the winter time, the temperature drops below zero Celsius. So the, if the, the ice would be d denser than water, the whole lake would just uh, turn into ice. But now, since the ice floats on water, as soon as the temperature drops below zero, uh, the surface, only the surface of the lake turns into ice. And ice is a thermal insulator, so it stops there, just on the, the, the surface you have ice. And then we have liquid water at four Celsius temperature, which is ideal for the fish to survive the winter. Really nice interplay with physics and chemistry, which also took a lot of foresight to predict the properties, to predict the problem, and to provide the solution before this mortal problem would happen on Earth. But now we have some uh, benefits of, of this solution, what I call foresight for fun. We can, we can go, for instance, ice fishing on the surface of the lakes. And we can also go ice skating for sight for fun. It's really amazing that we can skate, go skating on the surface of a solid. It's only possible on the surface of ice. You cannot go skating on rocks. And why is that so? The blade put a lot of pressure on solid water. And due to, to, due to the supernatural properties of water, as soon as you put pressure on uh, ice, it melts into water. So the blade is always lubricated by liquid water foresight for fun. Oh, and then we have snow, what I call glorious foresight. Uh, a show, a beautiful show of snowing that occurs in many places of the, the world. And also related to water, we, we have the ice crystals, what I call the extravagant and stylish foresight. Uh, people uh, have taken pictures of those crystals, the water crystals, and they all are, they are all different. They never have been a picture of a crystal, ice crystal that would be equal or, or the same as the other. And they have really, really nice shapes. So it's extravagant and stylish foresight. What about in life? Do we see foresight in life? Do we see this ability to predict the future in, in advance, provide solutions in life? Well, we have many, 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 many really, really, really beautiful examples of foresight in life. What I call the utmost ingenious foresight we see in life. So let me give you some examples. Like in our cells, we have a filter for water on the membranes, 
on the entrance. And this, this filter is really, really amazing. So what, what was the problem that was solved? Need a water filter to let water in the cell and dangerous chemicals out of the cell. The solution? Let's make a perfect water filter. filter. The aquaporins, they only allow water to go through. You can see here in this picture that the diameter of this filter, uh, the passage from this filter is exactly match the diameter of the water molecule. So only water goes through. It's amazing. So that was a mortal problem. If a dangerous chemical would enter the cell, the life, life would be destroyed. But we, if we compare this filter with the filters that we have made, the men have made, like a, a filter for water that you have in your house, uh, filters for water, uh, water that we have in the lab, we check the specifications of those filters. You see that they are not perfect. They are really good, they are efficient, but they are not 100% perfect. The only fully um, perfect, the only fully efficient water filter is in our cells, in our cells. But there was a major problem with this filter, the water filter, because we know in chemistry that uh, water works as a proton wire. Every, every place that water goes through, it will carry with uh, it protons, acid. So there was a dilemma in this filter. How come that a filter uh, let water enter the cell but blocks the proton? Uh, that was really, really, really a secret for science until somebody discovered that exactly at the passage of the water, there is a specific amino acid there, asparagine. And it's placed in, in a position as so that when the water passes through the filter, it clicks the water at 90 degrees. It's like cutting the wire, cutting the wire. It's a chemical cutter of the wire. And as you cut the proton wire, only water, freely water, pure water enters the cell. It's an utmost ingenious. Uh, foresight. In 2003, these two scientists, they won the Nobel Prize for discovering the aquaporins and how they work. So now I, can, I would like to make a question. If we gave the Nobel Prize to the scientists who discover how this filter works, what kind of prize would we give to whom develop it, designed it? Oh, another example, appendix. Uh, we had a problem to solve. We need to periodically wash intestine due to consumption of bad food. So what was the solution? Diarrhea. But diarrhea brought another problem. It's this jet washing of diarrhea eliminates from the gut beneficial bacteria. So what was the solution? hide gut bacteria in the appendix. Uh, evolution says the appendix is a vestigial organ. It is not. We know now that it has a really important function. It hide gut bacteria, beneficial gut bacteria in the appendix in the events of diarrhea. It also works really nice on our immune system. It's part of the immune system. But there was another problem. Modern societies would suffer from appendicides. What was the solution? Well, solution number one, let there be surgeons. Let there be surgeons. So if you, are, uh, you have this problem, you can go to hospitals. Uh, what was the best solution? Let there be chemists to develop antibiotics. It's an even better solution. Now, nowadays, when you have appendicides, you go to a hospital, most doctors will give you an antibiotics trying to preserve your very important appendix. Well, stay tuned for more. We have much, much, many, 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 many more examples in the book of this ingenious foresight 
that uh, works as a strong argument in favor of intelligent design. I will go really fast through these uh, examples and just talk about the problems and solutions that we find in them. For instance, the ribosomes, what was the problem? The correct knitting of amino acids to form the, pro the protein wires, how we, we could connect them in a very efficient way. The solutions, the ribosomes, these incre incre in incredible machines that goes connecting the amino acids in the perfect order to make a protein wire that will automatically uh, fold into functional shapes. Really interesting. I discuss this in my book. Another problem, cell would need a cargo transportation system. What was the solution? The kinesins. Robotic, nano-robotic machines that walks in the cells through highways, protein highways, transporting cargo through the cell. Really, really nice solution for a mortal problem, cargo transportation that was solved by these uh, uh, nano-structures, nano-robots. Another problem, really, really interesting problem, uh, some insects would need to jump really fast and straight, synchronized jumps to escape from predators. Uh, it's essential for their survival, like this Isus insect. So what was the solution? Best possible gears. The gears are conducting, are making those jumps really synchronized and really high jumps that they can do. It's amazing. And gears are the trademark of an uh, engineer uh, in, uh, uh, in the field of engineering. In incredible. Another problem that we see in life, uh, single sperm fertilization. We know that the uh, women egg is surrounded by hundreds of spermatozoids during fertilization. So what was the solution to have single sperm fertilization? Hardening of the, the egg wall. Amazing, amazing, amazing solution. Another problem, this is really nice and interesting. Uh, we have moths that live just for some, a few hours and they have to find the, the female to be able to reproduce, what I call the born to sex moth and they must rapidly find a female. So what was the solution? The most sensitive female detection system on Earth. Those antennas, they are able to detect a few molecules in the air. Many kilometers far away from the female, the male moth can detect the female. So he, uh, Reproduction can occur, so it was a really mortal problem. Few hours to find the female, and then this really, really uh, sensitive detection system, much, much, much more sensitive than mass spectrometers that I used to play with are. Well, if Daniel Hives from Discover Institute would have a system like that, he would have found his uh, uh, lovely uh, wife much earlier in time. Well, there is much, much more, much, much more in my book. So get it, buy it from the Amazon and read it through. Many other details and other problems and solutions that point, point undeniably to foresight, undeniably to foresight. So what is the conclusion of my talk? We're made by design. The irreducible complexity of the universe and life. The information that we find in life in many, many ways. The fine tuning of the universe. And now, as we have detected many, many, many examples of foresight, this ability to predict and shape the future that is unique to a mind. We can be more 
even more and more confident that an intelligent mind made the universe and made life. Using these abilities, uh, one of these abilities is to predict the future and to provide in advance the solutions for mortal problems. I'm also in, in Brazil, the president of the Brazilian uh, Society for Intelligent Design. You have here the uh, address for our website. Please access it. Uh, intelligent design is growing very fast in Brazil. And we, we would like to share this great news with you, that intelligent design is blooming in the country. And why is that so? Because the arguments of intelligent design makes a very strong case, a very strong case. And that's the end. It's my family. And I would like, uh, again, to thank all of you for listening and Discover Institute for inviting me, the organizers of this conference for inviting me. And let me reassure, I have been playing with science for many years, many years. And it's getting, day after day, it's getting, uh, the arguments for intelligent design are getting stronger and stronger. So day after day, data after day, data. What is clear from the advents of science is that we have been made by intelligent design. Thank you very much for listening.